first asked to um, uh, talk here at Beef Week, I was very reluctant because I'm actually not the business. The business is a partnership and Mervyn is a huge part of that business. So I did a deal with Mervyn. I said I'd talk and he had to answer all the questions. <laughs> so don't ask me a thing, thank you. I'm also not a numbers person and so this presentation is more of a photo essay of our business. So I also am not very experienced at this, I have to push buttons right. Okay, Umbabir is a 3,500 hectare property located in the Dawson Valley near Bohinia Downs, central Queensland. Historically, Umbabir was once a 65,000 acre run that became part of the Brigolo ballots, ballot scheme in the late 1960s and subsequently divided into numerous smaller blocks. The property retained the name Umbabir in reference to the Aboriginal named large permanent waterhole on the Zamia Creek waterway. As always, the benefits of having a valuable water asset also has a downside. The occasional flood where up to 65% of the total area can go underwater. As my father, who successfully won a nearby property on the, in a ballot scheme, Umbabir, was purchased from the original leaseholder in my mother's name. The property was developed in the early 1970s and about a third of it, the black flats on the floodplain country was cleared and developed for cropping. This has always been, been share farmed and both enterprises successfully coexist to this day. My mother Eleanor and I have been partners in the cattle enterprise since 1997. As we both mostly lived away from the property, the cattle were always managed by others. It has been a small and uncomplicated enterprise that provided steers to the Japox market. The traditional ma management strategy was to buy approximately 250 head of weaners, have 250 head of growing cattle, and then turn off about 250 head of finished cattle each year that ideally weighed 340 plus kilo dressed weight. I travelled extensively as a young adult, and even with four very small children, I lived in cities around Australia and in Zimbabwe at one point moving seven times in eight years. I eventually settled in Brisbane. Being such a city dweller with vivid childhood memories of grumpy cattle, it was, one of, it was with some trepidation that I moved back to Umbabir when given the opportunity. After moving, I was extremely lucky to meet Mervyn and his wife Stephanie in, 19, in 2009. They had just returned from a two-year working adventure that took them, their seven horses, three cats, and two, uh, and, sorry, three dogs and two cats to far-flung places in WA and the Northern Territory. Mervyn, with the help of his now four very loyal dogs, was able to give us five days a fortnight, and this was perfect for our requirements at Umbabir. One of the first things Mervyn could see about our business was the amount of time and feed that went into getting cattle to achieve desired sale weights. And season depending, the cattle would fatten, lose condition, then fatten again. He inquired about a market for smaller fat steers, and this is when MSA, or Meat Standards Australia, first came to our attention. We, re we registered and from then on started to sell cattle with the minimum fat requirement and younger. A local cattle buyer showed Mervyn how to visually determine fat depth. MSA required three mil of rib fat and the processors required six mil of rib fat. So you can actually see it's almost like a bagel. We call it a bagel around the tail. One of the drivers to improve any business is to increase turnover and selling cattle earlier <coughs> began to increase our turnover significantly. The new catch cry became, when they are fat, they are gone. We became accredited for PCAS in August 2014. I was drawn to the adaptability and resilience of the high-grade Brahmin, high Brahmin cattle and Mervyn considered that they were perfect for the market we were moving into. I see our business as a cycle and it begins with purchasing new cattle. Where possible we purchase high content Brahmin or Brahmin cross cattle as weaners and stores up to 400 kilogram on farm or from sale yards. We do not overly concern how, cattle, how the cattle look, provided they are quality, well conformed and deep in the body. As I wasn't always fully occupied at Umbabir, I started to go working with Mervyn. While it's not my primary interest to manage the cattle, being involved stepped up my observation skills and provided motivation to introduce other concepts that I had studied, such as kinesiology, 
biodynamics and geomancy, all of which work with the readily available natural energy that exists in and around all that is living. While difficult to explain or record results of these alternate principles, there is no doubt in Mervyn's and my mind that they, continue, that they contribute to the productivity and success of the business. The next significant management shift was around the use of chemical. I questioned why cattle, where, whether they had ticks or not, were treated with chemical as soon as they were purchased. It was explained that it was a preventative measure. However, I did begin researching for an alternative for both buffalo fly and ticks, and as I saw it as a, as I saw it as a challenge to reduce dependency on chemical products. Involvement with biodynamics gave me some ideas such as using sulphur and other products like cattle coat. Even though we weren't completely able to manage the fly and ticks, we were able to minimise the use of chemical problems, and this was a, a chemical products rather, and this was a great beginning. Supplements have become a regular part of our system, and Mervyn built movable trolleys to hold the, the individual products. The free choice lick system, based on Pat Colby's recommendations, consists of copper, sulphur, an ag lime seaweed meal mix, an organic mineral lick, and salt. The lolly trolley, as we call it, goes with every mob following a paddock change. We have observed that newly purchased cattle take quite a lot of mineral initially, and then in time, intake seems to drop. Different seasons seem to also influence their selection, but in general, healthy and balanced cattle instinctively know what they require. In November 2014, we began using a liquid molasses byproduct of ethanol. The cattle were struggling to maintain condition during dry seasons. In theory, I wanted to find a urea-based, uh, sorry, a urea-free product that would provide small amounts of sugar or energy to the cattle and via the dung contribute towards lifting the bricks levels in plants. This product has become a, a standout in our view and is put out during the dry winter months to tightly manage and maintain the condition of the cattle. My belief is that if the cattle are taking a supplement, it must be missing from the grasses and vegetation and therefore unavailable to the plants in the soil. By, by cattle taking the supplement, some of it returns to the soil via the dung. If the cattle are healthy and the pasture and vegetation quality high and diverse, the dung produced will be sought out by the dung beetles. For the last 12 months, we have also been trialling a biological soil activator product that is brewed with molasses in water. It is designed to stimulate soil microbial activity and given that soil health is vital to our business, we are always willing to try new ideas. Some perceived changes are healthy, healthy wetland can, ecosystems, returning, nat native, buffle, uh, sorry, returning native grasses and shrubs and herbage, signs of worm activity at the base of buffalo grass, visible mycorrhizal fungi and leaf litter, crumbling, improving black soil, increasing dung beetle pop populations. And let's not forget trees. Trees provide much needed shade and also valuable nutrients. This wet season we have identified three different types of dung beetles. The rollers and the pad dwellers and tunnelers. The tunnelling species are particularly beneficial as their tunnels aid water reten retention which in turn significantly stimulates pasture response. Much of what is being developed on the Umba beer can be explained by the term bioorganic agriculture a holistic production system that promotes and enhan enhances ecosystem health, including biodiversity, biologic, biological cycles, and soil biological activity. The cattle are valuable tools that can work with nature, with the natural environment to assist land rest restoration and management. This slide illustrates the sustainable nutritional cycle that is being developed. To obtain the premium price for MSA is to achieve ought to two dent with six mil of P8 fat. We recognise that, is, that this is not easy to achieve. An ossification of 140 equates to an approximate age of 18 months. That's out of the tips and tools MLA brochure. So as marbling is the last fat to be laid down, we actually do well to get an average marbling of 270 for such young cattle. 
A key to achieving low ossification is to have the confidence to sell cattle that may not be as heavy as the best money on offer, as long as the fat requirement is met. This requires an open mind and a willingness to learn through trial and error. For quite some time we used organic oil to assist with the management of ticks and buffalo fly. For this idea, that is oil plus essential oils, came oil plus garlic. Garlic is a well-known natural product that stimulates the immune system and is able to fight off bacteria and viral infections. It contains organosulfur compounds called sulphites which also repels insects. We had the idea to infuse garlic in cooking oil to use as a spray for buffalo fly. It was effective, how like, however, like the chemical products, it didn't last long as a repellent. I then looked into neem oil, and it also had repellent potential. So for, for the last six months, we've been using this concoction as both a spray for fly and a backliner for ticks with considerable success. This is the first year we have been completely chemical free. However, both the ticks and buffalo fly have to be monitored and when necessary, treatments are required. We haven't used chemical for ticks since 2012. In general, our focus has been on improving the health of the animals. The healthier the animal, the better their immune system, the less vulnerable to parasites and viruses, the greater potential the cattle have to grow and gain weight quickly. I will also add that in our experience, meeting nutritional requirements has improved the temperament and behaviour of the cattle, in particular the highly intelligent Brahmins. In human health, quality, chemical-free, unprocessed foods are more and more recognised as a behavioural management tool for children, an essential part of a recovery program for any illness and a logical step for physical and mental wellness. It makes sense that this translates to animal wellbeing. The more hands-on I became, the more I struggled with loading cattle on the trucks to the processor. Mervyn talked about how they used to keep coaches or Judas bullocks on some of the large stations. I liked the idea, and so over time we have invested in three pairs of coacher bullocks. We've got George and Stalker, Cheeky Hilux, Wally and Kimberly, and we're looking for another to pair up with Snoopy. All newly purchased cattle are put with George and Stalker. We can only see Stalker, George is off to the side. They actively seek us out, they're great leaders, and they teach the new cattle not to run and to follow when they are moved. All coaches except these two allow us to pat them. This connection with the other coaches in the paddock very quickly drops off the fear that cattle te naturally tend to have. So handling strategies for new, all newly purchased cattle. They have hay in the yards when they arrive. They're introduced to the dogs as soon as possible. They learn that it's not okay to be out of the mob and, they, and to stand when asked. They spend minimal time in the yards and we get them out onto quality feed outside the yards as quickly as possible and that's usually day one. They are put with the coaches into paddocks close to the yards with access to a lolly trolley, usually day two. And this is day two of very recently purchased cattle. They didn't run, they followed the coacher up to the car and it was very rewarding because that's me on my own in the, in the vehicle. <laughs> They are left to settle for a week or so before cross-banding or doing any work with them. General management pr principles. We stock conservatively to encourage native vegetation. All mobs have access to lolly trolleys. The mob sizes are up to 200 head, but the lead of the bullocks only around 100 head. We draft regularly. We always take the lead out of the bullocks as sales occur. The benefits of drafting are that we know how the cattle are performing. If they weigh more than 600 kilograms and have more than 6 mil of P8 fat, they're ready for sale. This also helps us make plan advanced sale bookings. The tail of the mob also appear to gain weight more rapidly once the lead are taken out. The cattle also get used to being mixed and this reduces dominating behaviour. We also regularly rotate paddocks. The benefits of rotation is that it's psychological benefits cattle as in nature, they like to roam. They can access different species of vegetation in different land types, and it also assists to minimise tick populations. Being consistent with these strategies has paid off. As the cattle become so settled, they allow us to spray them for buffalo fly in a makeshift enclosure using part of an ex existing fence, steel posts and hessian.
The benefits of this is that it saves time, it minimises disruption to the cattle, and of course it diminishes the buffalo fly numbers. That's, that's Stalker, one of our coaches. So pre-sale management strategies. Any mobs to be drafted out are brought close to the yards on quality feed the afternoon before load out. They are yarded, drafted and loaded as late as possible to meet processor curfew. This is a photo that's taken a few days ago and Mervyn will go home this afternoon and they are our first mob of PCAS to be sold tomorrow. It wasn't until I spoke to Jasira in July 2014 about the new MySA website that we realised it was generally perceived that Brahmins weren't capable of producing high eating quality scores in the MSA system. We were also surprised to see how consistently our Brahmin cattle were complying and producing very acceptable eating quality scores regardless of where they were purchased. I have been able to go back to the results of high grade Brahmin cattle we purchased three years in a row from Paul and Linda Oates at Barilla Creek. I could see that what Jess was seeing as these animals consistently had an eating quality score between 52 and 56, even though the index has an inbuilt handicap of approximately minus six points for tropical breed content and hump height. These high grade Brahmins, predominantly white Brahmins, to this day have been some of the best cattle we have had the pleasure of managing and I would like to acknowledge Paul and Linda for their excellence in the industry. The cattle in the video were virtually all Barilla Creek cattle. For producers working with my MSA, the, the for, with working with MSA, the my MSA website is well worth becoming familiar with. We have become much more interested in our results as the data and graphs are clear and self-explanatory. We have also become a lot more knowledgeable about the specific criteria for MSA grading. Data can also be downloaded into Excel and analysed according to the individual MSA criteria. So, somewhat by default, I am in the beef industry. Given this, we have chosen to produce a quality, grass-fed, free-range and, where possible, chemical-free product. To get to where we are today, we have introduced new ideas and concepts and created a system that has become very rewarding, both personally and financially. We have increased turnover in 2013-14 by 37 per cent and taxable profit by 40 per cent. In summary, while some of our practices may be considered alternate and unscientific, the system works for us. MSA results validate what we do, and I would encourage those who love the industry and value our lifestyle to think outside the box and have fun developing and sharing methods of best practice. And would I return to the city? Definitely not. I would like to leave you with the following quote by Ted Levitt, an American economist and Harvard professor who also coined the term globalisation. This quote seems relevant as today we are very much doing business in a global economy. Just as energy is the base of life, basis of life itself and ideas the source of innovation, so is innovation the, the vital spark of all human change, improvement and progress. Thank you MLA for this opportunity and a special thank you to Sarah for creating the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs>